Hi, everyone. Cl Hillary Clinton's emails have been the subject of so much outrage on the right and hand wringing on frustration on the left for the past six years. And much like an unwelcome house guest, the topic just won't go away. And it's back in the news following the FBI search at Mar a Lago, and in part thanks to Clinton herself. But for all the countless hours of cable news airtime spent on the Clinton email controversy, somehow, to this day, many of the facts remain fuzzy. Tonight, we're going to spend the full hour separ separating fact from fiction. Did she really bleach 30,000 emails? What's the deal with the smashed phones? Why didn't she get charged? And we'll explore how Clinton's conduct compares to Donald Trump's and the recently seized classified documents at Mar-a-Lago. Now, if you've watched Fox News in recent days, you'd think that Hillary Clinton committed a serious crime that went unpunished. So out of the 11,000 documents they took, only 100 had classification markings. And by the way, that's less than what Hillary had on her server. But we'll re really know the whole amount because she bleached 30,000 emails. We had Hillary Clinton's people destroying thousands and thousands of emails. She bleach bitted her server. She <laughs> smashed uh, her phone. That's a right? I mean, now. She tried to destroy evidence, right? The 33,000 emails she deleted with bleach bit or the devices that she had destroyed with hammers or the SIM cards that were removed from uh, the devices she had. Now, we will fact check all of that in a moment. But then, of course, you get the response from the left-leaning media over at CNN and MSNBC. Republicans, they're doing what they do best. They're going to their greatest hits and talking about Hillary Clinton's emails again. Are his supporters really going to roll out but her emails again? Lock her up is giving way now to leave him alone. And now even Clinton herself is weighing in, hawking merchandise with but her emails on it and condemning the latest reincarnation of the controversy. In a series of tweets last week, Clinton wrote, quote, I can't believe we're still talking about this, but my emails. The fact is that I had zero emails that were classified. Comey admitted he was wrong after he claimed I had classified emails. Trump's own State Department under two different secretaries found I had no classified emails. But is that really true? Now, unlike so many in the politicized media, we're actually interested in the facts so we can all have an educated discussion about it. So let's dive in and try to lay out in chronological order the chain of events in the Hillary Clinton email controversy. Began in 2014, when the House Select Committee on Benghazi asked the State Department for Clinton's emails. The State Department couldn't produce them all because Clinton had used a private email server instead of a government one, which was located in her home in Chappaqua, New York. So in response to the inquiry, Clinton turned over approximately 30,000 emails from this private server to the State Department. She also deleted another roughly 30,000 emails that she considered to be personal, which in theory would not be subject to any subpoena. Now, Clinton deleted the emails by using a service called BleachBit. And this has become a popular talking point, the idea that she bleached her emails. That makes it sound incredibly nefarious. BleachBit is a service which anyone can download for free online and use to basically free up space on your hard drive. Computer security experts have said that those who are actually looking to destroy data to the point where no one could recover it would, should use, more sophisticated software. Plus, the FBI eventually recovered almost half of the, quote, bleached emails. But as exaggerated as that point is, Clinton's hands are not clean here. In March of 2015, a State Department spokesperson went on the record to deny that Clinton classified emails on her, that, that Clinton had classified emails on her private server. And in July, Clinton herself denied it, saying, quote, I'm confident that I never sent nor received any information that was classified at the time it was sent and received. The FBI will later allege that that remark wasn't true. In August of 2015, the State Department released 7,000 of the Clinton emails and marked 125 of them as retroactively classified. The State Department would go on to release several more batches through the rest of 2015 and early 2016, in which a handful of the emails were similarly retroactively designated as classified. Now, retroactive classification is very different from an item that one ought to know is classified. 
A few days later, Clinton apologized for using the private server for work emails, saying, quote, yes, I should have used two email addresses, one for personal matters and one for my work at the State Department. Not doing so was a mistake. I'm sorry about it, and I take full responsibility. But I guess that depends on how you define full responsibility. Fast forward to July 2016. Then FBI Director James Comey said Clinton and her team were, quote, extremely careless in their handling of very sensitive, highly classified information. And that's a key phrase here as it pertains to the comparison between the Clinton email investigation and the investigation into the classified documents found at Mar-a-Lago. Comey determined that an indictment requires, quote, clearly intentional and willful mishandling of classified information. You've heard some commentators refer to the Clinton standard. That's what it'll take for the DOJ to bring charges against Donald Trump. I, I think that's probably right. Withholding classified documents, not enough. He has to have willfully mishandled classified documents. Maybe they don't have to be classified. It could just be national defense information. We'll get to that. And that is why Trump's actions after the subpoena was issued may become so significant. Now, coming back to James Comey. Comey also revealed that more than 100 emails on 52 different chains were determined to have contained classified information at the time they were sent or received. Different from retroactive classification the State Department was doing as it was reviewing the emails and releasing them to the public. This is important. So let's break down some specifics here. Of the 52 email chains identified by Comey as classified, eight contain top secret information, 36 contain secret information, and the remaining eight had confidential information. Now, here's where it gets confusing. Only three of those emails, according to Comey, were marked as classified at the time they were sent or received. And all three were confidential, the lowest form of classification. And two days later, Comey actually walked that back further, testifying before Congress that the markings were extremely subtle and hidden within the body of the text, not at the top, which would be standard procedure. So this is what Clinton was referring to when she tweeted that Comey, quote, admitted he was wrong. Still, Clinton herself is probably wrong when she claims she had zero emails that were classified. And that's not counting the hundreds of emails retroactively classified. Now, the fact that she may not have necessarily known does become very relevant in the context of a criminal investigation. But it doesn't change the reality of what was in there. Then in early September of 2016, the FBI released its full report on the Clinton emails. And notably, it mentioned a Clinton aide named Justin Cooper, who recalled, quote, two instances where he destroyed Clinton's old mobile devices by breaking them in half or hitting them with a hammer. Yes, that happened. Now, this is significant. This has been a favorite attack line for many on the right. And we'll dive in further into that particular issue. But it seems clear destroying the phones in and of itself may not have been a problem. The question is how, why, and by whom? And Cooper's motives were a bit unclear. Was she looking to keep data from falling into the wrong hands or something more sinister? Again, we'll revisit that later. Now, also in the FBI report were details about the person who deleted the emails. A computer specialist for Colorado-based company called Platte River Networks later reported to be a guy named Paul Combetta. In December of 2014, Clinton's former chief of staff, Cheryl Mills, told Platte River Networks that old emails were to be deleted after 60 days. That was the rule. Now, Combetta apparently realized he had missed the 60-day deadline and scrambled to delete the emails using BleachBit sometime between March 25th and March 31st, 2015. 20, um, Combetta was given immunity and repeatedly questioned, but it was clear the FBI concluded that he acted on his own and was not directed to erase them after the subpoena. Cheryl Mills was given immunity, which is also a popular argument against her, but it was extremely narrow in scope, relating only to her personal contact with the classified emails and not any actions she took on behalf of Hillary Clinton. Now, of course, Comey wrote his infamous letter to Congress on October 28, 2016, 11 days before the 2016 election, notifying them that the FBI was reviewing additional emails 
potentially connected to Clinton's server. He followed up with a second letter nine days later, two days before the election, after realizing that the information they found on Anthony Weiner's laptop did not give the Bureau any cause to change its conclusions from the investigation because it contained no new information. So even after everything I just laid out, I still have so many questions. <laughs> and here to help break it down are two people very familiar with the investigation. Josh Gerstein, senior legal affairs reporter for Politico, who has been covering it for years, and Mark Zaid, a former national security attorney uh, who often deals with cases involving classified information and actually was involved in trying to get some of the information involved in this case. Thank you to both of you for coming on the program. Appreciate it. All right, first, let me just try and sort one thing out. Josh, on the question of was there any classified information on the Hillary Clinton emails, is there a yes or no answer? Yeah, I think the answer is definitely yes. There was information that the government considered to be classified. I, I use that, that wording advisedly, Dan, because I'm not somebody who takes the government's claims about um, what is really a national security secret and what isn't at face value. But, but I think it's pretty clear that there were things in there uh, that, according to the official rule books and guidebooks of the federal government, should have been classified at various levels. Mark Zay, do you agree with that first question? As far as everything that's factually known, yes. Uh, look, information can be easily reclassified. I'm not as concerned about that component of it, that there was a retroactive classification. But it seems pretty clear that in the, some of the email chains, there was information, as you discussed in your very uh, helpful timeline, that was marked classified or certainly was classified at the time, and they should have known it. All right, Josh, now let me ask you a sort of, for someone who's been covering this as long as you have, what part of this story do you feel either hasn't gotten enough attention or has been overplayed by the media? I'm just trying to focus us on the right sort of things here. Well, I mean, I think if you're talking about the Clinton part uh, of this story, I do think the question of whether stuff was actually marked as classified is pretty important. Maybe it's not that important in terms of uh, whether somebody is uh, responsible for having, you know, treated national security secrets in a cavalier way. But when you're talking about a criminal prosecution, I think just sort of saying, well, this information is pretty similar to stuff we consider classified, therefore you're going to go to jail, is, I have to say, they kind of crazy in, in a couple different respects. One is they could, you know, that's a judgment call about how similar it is. And unless the person actually, you know, sees a, a, a guidance on it that says top secret or, or secret, um, you know, maybe they just didn't think about it. Uh, so that's one issue. And the other issue that, that, that gnaws at me about this is when you start saying somebody should have been prosecuted, I always come back to what is the baseline? If you're talking not about whether the information was marked classified, but maybe whether somebody discussed a topic that was classified in a channel where they shouldn't have done so. Um, that could be Clinton's private email account. That could be a meeting with people that were not properly cleared. That could even be an unclassified system at the State Department or at the White House. Um, I have to tell you, Mark, I have to all research. This happens in the federal government dozens, if not hundreds of times every single day because people are human. And so there has to be some way to distinguish between carelessness and mistakes and yeah. misunderstandings and, you know, really dastardly conduct. And, and, and that's what tends to get lost in this and, discussion. And that goes to the question, the legal question of intentionality. And Mark, I think what some people who felt that Hillary Clinton should have been prosecuted for when you talk about intentionality is they say, well, she intentionally created this server in her home when she should have known that she wasn't allowed to do it and that she was putting uh, government secrets at risk, et cetera. What do you make of that, Mark? Yeah, I want to say outright, I, I am still, frankly, outraged six years, no, I guess six, seven years later, or however long it is now, that Secretary Clinton and more precisely her senior staff thought that was appropriate. I mean, I know some of her senior staff. I actually count them as friends. 
and I am flabbergasted that they thought that was appropriate and that the lawyers in the legal advisor's office of the State Department, once people found out, or the diplomatic security staff who handles securing and protecting classified information with the department, once they found out about that, that someone didn't basically tell the emperor, hey, there's no clothes here. What are you doing, Madam Secretary? Yep. You can't have that. And back in, oh gosh, I think it was 2015, I actually represented the Republican National Committee to help find out more about what Hillary Clinton was doing with her server and the emails. And I litigated a, a Freedom of Information Act case, trying to get access to former State Department officials uh, and more information about all of this. The problem is, and in, in sort of direct answer to what you had asked Josh, the storyline that has been either overblown or really not discussed enough is that this goes well beyond Hillary Clinton. There are some really serious fact questions about what the secretary knew at the time versus a lot of other people. And one of the decisions that was undertaken by the Justice Department as to why they didn't prosecute anyone was because they would have had to have prosecuted, I saw over a, a, a statement of over a hundred people yeah. who participated yeah. in the discourse on the yeah. server with all the emails and had access to this information. And that was going to be crazy to do. Let me ask you to just stick around. We're gonna keep going uh, on this. I've got more questions for both of you. Coming up, we're gonna have more of our Clinton more email Clinton. fact check. I should add here that we found no evidence that any of the additional work-related emails were intentionally deleted in an effort to conceal them in some way. Although there is evidence of potential violations of the statutes regarding the handling of classified information, our judgment is that no reasonable prosecutor would bring such a case. Then FBI Director James Comey addressed the Hillary Clinton emails issue in 2016 when he announced that the Bureau would not seek charges against Clinton. Now, of the more than 30,000 emails Clinton turned over to the State Department, 110 messages in 52 email chains, according to Comey, obtained some, contained some classified information when they were sent or received. Eight contained top secret information, 36 contained secret information, and eight had confidential information. Comey said three emails were confidential when they were sent or received. But because there were so many fragments, there'd been confusion over just how many emails contained sensitive information. Comey determined that Clinton's lawyers likely overlooked some emails because of the way they searched, not in an intentional effort to obstruct the investigation. The lawyers doing the sorting for Secretary Clinton in 2014 did not individually read the content of all of her emails as we did for those available to us. Instead, they relied on header information, and they used search terms to try to find all work-related emails among the reportedly more than 60,000 that were remaining on her system at the end of 2014. It's highly likely that their search missed some work-related emails and that we later found them. Join me again uh, is Josh Gerstein from Politico, who's been covering this for years, and Mark Zay, uh, attorney who deals with national security issues and actually was involved uh, in trying to get access uh, to these emails on behalf of the RNC. Um, thank you both uh, for coming back. Appreciate it. Let me ask you, Mark, one of the questions a lot of people ask is about the immunity deals that were offered to Cheryl Mills and also to the computer specialist who was involved in the deleting of a lot of the emails here. Um, is there any reason for suspicion or concern about those deals? Oh, I'm sure some people will make a lot of it that uh, that I do not. Uh, look, I think in the Clinton case, much as with the Trump case, the issue is really was looking then is looking now at what intentional efforts were being undertaken to thwart the government from retrieving possession of classified information to obstruct the investigations to cover anything up or to provide false statements or very blatantly lie to the U.S. government. And those are some very different attributes of both the types of cases. So the immunity deals in the Clinton case appeared designed to find out whether or not there was an intentional cover-up uh, of what 
the mess of emails that they had and whether they were trying to thwart the U.S. government from finding out what was going on, uh, not necessarily to, you know, and, and as well, I'm sure, to figure out, you know, where it might have gone higher up, so to speak. Uh, but it's always easy for the government to go after the lowest hanging fruit, whether it's Clinton's case or might be in Trump's case. So I don't see anything suspicious. I saw it as a very uh, normal tactic of, of the FBI and the Justice Department to try and find out the ground truth. And Josh, you've been covering this a long time. This is something Hillary Clinton hasn't wanted to talk about a lot. It's obviously been brought back into the forefront as a result of the search at Mar-a-Lago. And yet now she's kind of doubling down, right? She's hawking merchandise with the but her emails on it, et cetera. Were you surprised by that? No, because I think that she has a level of indignance about what went on here. And, and she's never, while she made some statements, you know, going into the campaign in 2016, uh, saying that she took this seriously, I think it's been made pretty clear since then that, that her position, the position of most of her aides has been that this was like a minor uh, a minor issue, you know, the, the current phrase might be a few overdue library books, and that, uh, you know, it, it did not d deserve the level of attention that it got. And I think, look, there's also an underlying, underlying um, bitterness there because uh, many members of the Clinton camp genuinely feel that the focus on this issue during the 2016 is one of the significant factors, if not maybe the decisive factor in Donald Trump winning that election and given their views on that, I'm not at all surprised um, that they would have a, a sense of grievance around this episode that lingers to this day. Right. As I always say, everyone is blaming the FBI, um, no matter which side you're on. Very quickly, Mark, before we get to our next topic, he, uh, Josh referred to the Clinton team not taking it seriously. I think you and I have talked about this before, but I think you agree with me, right, that this is A, very serious, A, real wrongdoing, but B, not criminal. Yeah, well, I mean, you could even make the case that perhaps it was criminal, but I would say not prosecutable. Mm. Uh, the provision that was at stake here under 18 U.S.C. 793, dealing with gross negligence, has rarely been used. Right. The definitions of what gross negligence even means is, frankly, unknown. Uh, and as I said before, there would have been so many additional prosecutions beyond Clinton. It just didn't make sense. But was it serious? Yes, absolutely serious. And it set a, a horrible example for the people underneath her as to how to practice safe security. And I think she does a disservice by continuing to mock it um, as I well. I agree. Um, all right, absolutely. Uh, I'm gonna, uh, we're going to keep going on this. We're doing the hour on this. So I'm going to ask you both to stick around after the FBI closed of the investigation into Hillary Clinton's emails, there was a salacious detail that came out that an aide destroyed Hillary Clinton's cell phones. We will dig into what really happened and how important that was. Welcome back. We continue our hour-long deep dive into the Hillary Clinton email saga. In September 2016, when the FBI made documents relating to its closed investigation of Clinton public, the right and then Republican nominee Donald Trump focused on a particular detail, that at some point a Clinton aide used a hammer to smash the former Secretary of State's old mobile devices. She even mysteriously lost 13 different phones before the FBI got them. And many were destroyed with a hammer. Oh, can you believe this? Destroyed them with a hammer. The old-fashioned way, I guess. The ordeal had the cable news world in chaos as allegations were flying, including this instance that had a then-CNN anchor stunned. They destroyed blackberries with hammers in the State Department. That's not what won the presidency. Like, actually, and that, by Evan, the way, Evan, Evan, no, Evan, Evan, hold on. Way, can you the fact check that? Hang on, that hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, Evan Perez. Hammers, fact check that for me, please, on the fly. Uh, yes, they did, Brooke. Uh, as Thanks, as, uh, <laughs> as did. you mentioned, there were uh, 13 devices, mobile devices, and five iPads that uh, the FBI said that you know, in some way, were used with with her private email server, and they did, in some cases, just destroy them with hammers when they were done using them. So here are the facts: Investigators determined a total of 13 devices were associated with Clinton's two phone numbers and personal email domain. 
eight of which she used during her tenure as Secretary of State. The FBI requested that all 13 devices be handed over. Clinton's attorneys informed the FBI they were unable to locate any of these devices. Hillary's longtime aide, Huma Abedin, told agents that the whereabouts of Clinton's unwanted devices would, quote, frequently become unknown. Now, Clinton aide Justin Cooper did recall two instances where he destroyed Clinton's old mobile devices by breaking them in half or hitting them with a hammer. So you might think that sounds bad. But at the time, disposing of the phones was not considered unusual. It was common to get rid of devices so that data stored on them would not fall into the wrong hands. Technology magazine Wired in September of 2016 published this article titled, Actually, Clinton Should Have Destroyed Her Phones Better. Politics aside, the best way to destroy data is often physical destruction, ideally a blender and fire. But the most important question becomes, why were the phones destroyed? Is there any evidence it was nefarious? And is this really as normal as Wired and others have suggested? Let me throw that question to Josh Gerstein, senior legal affairs reporter for Politico. Josh, what to make of the allegations and defenses with regard to the smashed phones? Yeah, well, Dan, I'm, I'm not aware of any evidence that the smashing of the phones was related to an effort to get rid of data in some kind of universal or permanent way. As far as I know, it was a pretty standard situation where, you know, the phones would either, either have problems or uh, she would be upgrading or something along those lines, although apparently she liked the old-fashioned Blackberries with the rollerball in it, and they had to, you know, go out on eBay and stuff and look for those. But when they became unserviceable or what have you, uh, it was pretty standard for them to dispose of the phones or try to break them. Uh, I think the idea being so that somebody else wouldn't get this information. But but my understanding from what Justin Cooper said or testified or said to the FBI was that uh, this was after the phones had been migrated. It wasn't an effort to get rid of the information. In fact, it was part of an effort to move that information from one BlackBerry to another while it was still on the same account. They did, I think, sometimes lose some data, as a lot of us do in those transitions. Uh, but I haven't seen any indication that that part of it uh, was intentional. Uh, Mark Zaid, you do a lot of national security cases. Have you seen people smashing phones to, to get rid of documentation, to protect it, in effect? And what do you make of the argument that the Clinton camp has here? I don't think I've actually ever seen it, but I, I think some of my intelligence clients would probably say they have destroyed their cell phones. For one thing, these were private cell phones, not government. Ironically, the government does things similar. I, I don't know if they necessarily destroy it with a hammer, <laughs> but the government wipes the, everyone's cell phones once they're, they're out of service. Um, we had that recently yep. with respect to the former acting secretary of the Department of Homeland Security in the Trump administration where his cell phones apparently no longer have the information. And the response was, because that's normal. They wipe it. Now, the difference between Clinton's situation and the Trump situation is, again, there was no indication this was trying to hide anything. There was no indication of obstruction of anything. And I think any of us who have had cell phones in the last 20 years, but certainly in the last five, where the technology is much better, knows that even destroying the physical phone doesn't necessarily destroy and a what, lot of the data and, on it. And Josh, what about the 11 other phones? Well, I mean, I think that was a concern that the FBI had. And I don't think it, their concern was that they were trying to hide the information. The concern was there, the FBI determined there was classified information in Clinton's account. And they wanted to know, could other people, potentially foreign intelligence services, could this end up in the wrong hands? I mean, look at these episodes we've had uh, with the Hunter Biden situation, for example, right, where people abandon their stuff or, or hawk it or something, and uh, so someone then turns up with that information and starts trying to make hay out of it. All right, I'm going to ask you both again to stick around, because coming up, Hillary Clinton has sometimes seemed to take responsibility for the email scandal and then at other times been totally defiant. We've been focusing tonight's show on the saga of Hillary Clinton and her emails. It goes all the way back to 2014. For eight years, that private server she used to host both personal and government emails has become a political obsession. Now, we want to play some of 
her responses in her own words. From the beginning, Clinton fought hard against those who accused her of any wrongdoing. Back in 2015, when she was running for president, she was asked during a campaign event if she had wiped her server clean. The FBI believes that you tried to wipe the entire server. Did you try to wipe the entire, so that there'd be no email, no personal, no official, wipe well, the whole thing? Well, my personal emails are my personal business. So that, that's all I could say. I'm, I'm not, you know, I don't, I have no idea. That's why we turned it over. So we, you were in charge of it. You were the official in charge. Did you wipe the server? What, like with a cloth or something? No. Well, you no. You know how it works digitally. Did you try to I, wipe the whole server? I don't know how it works digitally at all. And she tried to minimize the episode with jokes. By the way, you may have seen that I recently launched a Snapchat account. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Those messages disappear all by themselves. But it stopped being really a laughing matter, as evidenced by this tense back and forth with even more liberal hosts like CNN's Brianna Keeler. Did you or any of your aides delete any government-related emails from your personal account? We did not. In fact, my direction to uh, uh, conduct the thorough investigation was to err on the side of providing anything uh, that could be possibly uh, viewed as work-related. I did not email any um, classified material to anyone on my email. There is no classified material. Well, as the 2016 campaign continued, it was used as a cudgel by then-candidate Trump, who made his threat during the second presidential debate. If I win, I am going to instruct my attorney general to get a special prosecutor to look into your situation, because there has never been so many lies, so much deception, there has never been anything like it. And we're going to have a special prosecutor. There has never been anything like this where emails and you get a subpoena. You get a subpoena. And after getting the subpoena, you delete 33,000 emails. We'll talk about how those words may be coming back to haunt the former president in a moment. But Clinton eventually took some responsibility for having the private email server in the first place. That was a mistake. And I take responsibility for using a personal email account. Uh, obviously, if I were to do it over again, I would not. I'm not making any excuses. Uh, it was a mistake, and I am very uh, sorry about that. But and in the years that followed, she stopped really admitting that it was a mistake. The former Secretary of State largely laid low about her emails. And there were multiple investigations by Inspector General, a follow-up investigation by the State Department, each found that Hillary Clinton was careless with her private email server, but that it didn't rise to the level of either intentional misconduct or criminal, depending on who was doing the investigation. But even though former FBI Director James Comey did not charge her, Clinton still blames him for his press conference held 11 days before the election, as she told NBC in December of last year while discussing former President Trump. Yeah, I, I tried to warn people. I tried to make the case that uh, this was really dangerous. The people he was allied with, what they were saying, what he might do. I do think but for Jim Comey and the stunt he pulled uh, 10 days before the election, I would have won. And cut to just last week when Clinton and her daughter Chelsea appeared on The View and were asked about reports of classified documents seized from Mar-a-Lago and how it will play out for Trump. What is your feeling about that. You know, I, I don't know, Joy, and I don't want to prejudge. I've been prejudged wrongly enough. Mm. I'm not going to prejudge somebody <laughs> okay. else. Yeah, and yeah. so I think the key is what the facts and the evidence are. Probably best for her to abide by that biblical passage, do not judge lest ye be judged. Coming up, since the search of Mar-a-Lago, many of the former president's allies have been quick to compare it to the Clinton email saga, even suggesting that what Clinton did is worse. Is it really a fair comparison? That's next. No surprise that ever since the FBI executed its search warrant at Mar-a-Lago, many of former President Trump's defenders and even some of his detractors have been quick to compare the entire ordeal to the investigation of Hillary Clinton's handling of her emails, which we have been discussing for the hour. And to be fair, Hillary Clinton herself has eagerly jumped back into the spotlight and fed into this 
tweeting last week, I can't believe we're still talking about my emails, but my emails. As Trump's problems continue to mount, the right is trying to make this about me again. There's even a Clinton standard. The fact is that I had zero emails that were classified. Now, we've already discussed uh, that issue already, that there were classified emails. But Clinton even used the opportunity to hawk merchandise, referencing her email scandal. Meanwhile, even some prominent lawmakers on Capitol Hill are trying to make the same comparison, even suggesting that what Clinton did is worse. Is it right for the president to take these government documents, which he's supposed to turn over to the National Archives, down to Mar-a-Lago? Uh, it was, you should be very careful with classified documents. I've been, had access to documents like that for a long time. I'm incredibly careful. I was wondering as I was listening to that discussion if the same things were said uh, when Secretary Clinton had documents, when Director Comey had documents. They had them on the Internet, which is much more dangerous than having them in a box somewhere. Now, before I explain why the comparison I don't think quite works, let me be transparent with you on where I stand on each of them. In 2016, I said Hillary Clinton was reckless and her decision to use a private server was wrong, even though she said she did nothing wrong. On January 29, 2016, I wrote on ABCnews.com, it's critical to start by separating foolish and even potentially shady behavior from criminal. It should be clear to any objective observer that it was an enormous error for Clinton to use a homemade server for all of her emails while she was in a position that regularly handles and assesses the most sensitive of government secrets. I also did not believe that she should be prosecuted because you didn't have the level of intentionality needed to keep or hide government documents. That's what the FBI found and that made sense legally to me. And as I've said before on this show, I'm not yet convinced that former President Trump will be indicted either. That will depend on what we learn about his level of intentionality. Doesn't mean he shouldn't be, but we shall see. And admittedly, things look grim when you look at the number of times the DOJ and the FBI tried to get those higher than top secret documents back from Mar-a-Lago and the many ways in which Trump's legal team hemmed and hawed and possibly outright lied about which documents were where. Now, with Hillary's situation, you had intentionality to create a private server, and it seems that was probably to avoid freedom of information requests. It was wrong. Same way if President Trump had just been circumventing the Presidential Records Act, I would say wrong, but absolutely should not be charged. The key is you didn't have her intentionally removing top secret documents. The claim that she destroyed the thousands of emails is true. But as we've discussed, the FBI found zero evidence that they were deleted deliberately to avoid a subpoena. Somebody in Trump's orbit was repeatedly not being truthful with the FBI about the documents. Doesn't mean it was Donald Trump himself. But remember, at the time Clinton's emails came to light, Trump made a campaign promise there would be no more funny business when it came to classified documents. In my administration, I'm going to enforce all laws concerning the protection of classified information. No one will be above the law. Well, now the spotlight is on him. And rather than wait to see what the FBI has in the months since the raid, some Trump allies are trying to gin up the outrage machine. If there's a prosecution of Donald Trump for mishandling classified information after the Clinton debacle, which you presided over and did a hell of a good job, there'll be riots in the streets. Now, putting aside the danger about talking about riots in the streets, what few have pointed out about what Lindsey Graham said there was he was being very lawyerly by referring to mishandling classified information, because that's not one of the statutes Trump is even being investigated for. So I'll say it again. These are two polarizing figures with very different sets of facts. And in one case, we don't have all the facts yet, so let's hold off. But hey, in the world of cable news, why would that stop both sides' political media machines from fomenting outrage? But here to continue a civil, nuanced, and fact-based discussion is Jock Gerstein, senior legal affairs reporter for Politico, and Mark Zaid the national security attorney. All right, so Josh, I've, I'm sure you have heard a lot of people making this comparison between the Clinton and the Trump cases. What do you make of that comparison? I don't think it's a very apt comparison because in large part what we see in that photo that 
the FBI uh, released uh, at the time of the search or shortly after, showing you know folder after folder uh, with top secret SCI banners on it that even somebody who doesn't handle classified information on a regular basis would recognize needs to be treated in a very careful way. And it just seems like an enormous distinction uh, between that and the Clinton email server where you arguably had references to things that were classified and the most obvious note of anything cla being classified on there uh, was perhaps uh, this little C with a, a, you know, a parentheses on either side, which is something very, very different. So uh, I don't see them as terribly similar, but I also think, Dan, it's unlikely um, that we're going to see a prosecution over this classified issue alone, because despite what President Trump said there, when it comes to classified information, to some degree, the president is above the law. Uh, he is it stands in different shoes than even a secretary of state. So if he does get prosecuted, I think it's going to be something around obstruction of justice and lies being told to the Justice Department and not really about those documents that are strewn about yeah, in his office at Mar-a-Lago. I, I think you're right. And, and, you know, it's so hard to have this discussion without people immediately attributing political motivations. And, Mark, that's why you're sort of a perfect guest on this, because you represented the RNC in an effort to get these documents. You've been a, a sort of a straight shooter on things related to national security, You've been critical of Hillary Clinton. Um, what do you make of it? Yeah, you know, honestly, if Trump and his team had returned everything back in June to the Justice Department, FBI, and National Archives, I don't think there would ever be a prosecution, no matter how much classified information yep. he had maintained at Mar-a-Lago. And as Josh was talking about with that photo, these cases between Clinton's emails and Trump are so fundamentally different based on the information, especially the level of information at the highest classification levels for Trump. It's what happened after Trump's lawyers certified that there were no longer any records. Yep. It's that obstruction reference that Josh and you were both talking about. Josh Gerstein, Mark Zaid, thank you for this in-depth discussion. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Dan. And thank you for watching. Go to NewsNationNow.com to find NewsNation on your cable provider. And don't forget to click the red subscribe button below to get more of NewsNation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.